Section ten of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine. Conclusion of the history of Agnes. In order that the reader may understand how Agnes could perceive any object outside the window, in the intense darkness of that tempestuous night, or rather morning, for it was now past one o'clock, we must observe that not only was the apartment in which Wagner and herself were seated brilliantly lighted by the silver lamps, but that, according to Florentine custom, there were also lamps suspended outside to the veranda, or large balcony belonging to the casements of the room above. Agnes and Wagner were, moreover, placed near the window which looked into a large garden attached to the mansion, and thus it was easy for the lady, whose eyes happened to be fixed upon the casement, in the earnest interest with which she was relating her narrative, to perceive the human countenance that appeared at one of the panes. The moment her history was interrupted by the ejaculation of alarm that broke from her lips, Wagner started up and hastened to the window, but he could see nothing save the waving evergreens in his garden, and the light of a mansion which stood at a distance of about two hundred yards from his own abode. He was about to open the casement and step into the garden, when Agnes caught him by the arm, exclaiming wildly, "'Leave me not! I could not! I could not bear to remain alone!' "'No, I will not quit you, Agnes,' replied Wagner, conducting her back to the sofa and resuming his seat by her side. "'But wherefore that ejaculation of alarm? Whose countenance did you behold? Speak, dearest Agnes!' "'I will hasten to explain the cause of my terror,' retorted Agnes, becoming more composed. "'Ere now I was about to detail the particulars of my journey to Florence, in company with the Count of Riverola, and attended by Antonio. But as those particulars are of no material interest, I will at once pass on to the period when we arrived in this city.' "'But the countenance at the window?' said Wagner, somewhat impatiently. "'Listen, and you will soon know all,' replied Agnes." it was in the evening when i entered florence for the first time antonio had proceeded in advance to inform his mother a widow who resided in a decent house but in an obscure street near the cathedral that she was speedily to receive a young lady as a guest this young lady was myself and accordingly when the count assisted me to alight from my horse at the gate at dame margaretha's abode the good widow had everything in readiness for my reception the count conversed with her apart for a few minutes and i observed that he also placed a heavy purse in her hand doubtless to ensure her secrecy relative to the amour with the existence of which he was of course compelled to acquaint her having seen me comfortably installed in dame margaretha's best apartment he acquitted me with a promise to return on the morrow Agnes paused for a few moments, sighed, and continued her narrative in the following manner. Fortunately for me, Dame Margaretha was a German woman, who had married an Italian, otherwise my condition would have been wretched in the extreme. She treated me with great kindness, mingled with respect. Although but a poor peasant girl, I was beloved and protected by one of the most powerful nobles of Florence. I retired early to rest, sleep did not however immediately visit my eyes oh no i was in florence but my thoughts were far away in my native germany and on the borders of the black forest at length i fell into an easy slumber and when i awoke the sun was shining through the lattice i arose and dressed myself and to my ineffable delight found that i was no longer to wear the garb of a page that disguise had been removed while i slept and in its place were costly vestments, which I donned with a pleasure that triumphed over the gloom of my soul. In the course of the morning rich furniture was brought to the house, and in a few hours the apartments allotted to me were converted, in my estimation, into a little paradise. The Count arrived soon afterward, and I now, pardon me the neglect and ingratitude which my verts confess, I now felt very happy. The noble Andrea enjoined me to go abroad but seldom, and never without being accompanied by Dame Margaretha. He also besought me not to appear to recognise him should I chance to meet him in public at any time, nor to form acquaintances, in a word, to live retired and secluded as possible, 
alike for his sake and mine own i promised compliance with all he suggested and he declared in return that he would never cease to love me dwell not upon details agnes said wagner for although i am deeply interested in your narrative my curiosity is strangely excited to learn the meaning of that terror which overcame you ere now i will confine myself to material facts as much as possible returned agnes time glided rapidly away months flew by and with sorrow and shame must i confess that the memories of the past the memories of the bright happy days of my innocence intruded but little on the life which i led for though he was so much older than i yet i loved the count of river ola devotedly oh heaven knows how devotedly his conversation delighted fascinated me and he seemed to experience a pleasure in imparting to me the extensive knowledge which he had acquired to me he unbent as doubtless to human being he never unbent before in my presence his sternness his sober moods his gloomy thoughts vanished it was evident that he had much preying on his mind and perhaps he loved me thus fondly because by some unaccountable whim or caprice or strange influence he found solace in my society the presents which he heaped upon me but which have been nearly all snatched from me but of immense value and when i remonstrated with him on account of a liberality so useless to one whom he allowed to want for nothing he would reply but remember agnes then i shall be no more riches will constitute your best friend your safest protection for such is the order of things in this world he generally spent two hours with me every day and frequently visited me again in the evening thus did time pass and at length i come to that incident which will explain the terror i ere now experience agnes cast a hasty glance toward the window as if to assure herself that the object of her fears was no longer there and satisfied on this head she proceeded in the following manner it was about six months ago that i repaired as usual on the sabbath morning to mass accompanied by dame margaretha when i found myself the object of some attention on the part of a lady who was kneeling at a short distance from the place which i occupied in the church the lady was enveloped in a dark thick veil the ample folds of which concealed her countenance and meandered over her whole body's splendidly symmetrical length of limb in such a manner as to aid her rich attire in shaping rather than hiding the contours of that matchless form i was struck by her fine proportions which gave her even in her kneeling attitude a queen-like and majestic air and i longed to obtain a glimpse of her countenance the more so as i could perceive by her manner and the position of her head that from beneath her dark veil her eyes were intently fixed upon myself at length the scrutiny to which i was thus subjected began to grow so irksome nay even alarming that i hurriedly drew down my own veil which i had raised through respect for the sacred altar whereat i was kneeling still i knew that the stranger lady was gazing on me i felt that she was a certain uneasy sensation amounting almost to a superstitious awe convinced me that i was the object of her undivided attention suddenly the priests in procession came down from the altar and as they passed us i instinctively raised my veil again through motives of deferential respect at the same instant i glanced toward the stranger lady she also drew back the dark covering from her face oh what a countenance was then revealed to me a countenance of such sovereign beauty that though of the same sex i was struck with admiration but in the next moment a thrill of terror shot through my heart for the fascination of the basilisk could scarcely paralyse its victim with more appalling effect than did the eyes of that lady it might be conscience qualms excited by some unknown influence it might even have been imagination but it nevertheless appeared as if those large black burning orbs shot forth lightnings which seared and scorched my very soul for that splendid countenance of almost unearthly beauty was suddenly marked by an expression of such vindictive rage such ineffable hatred such ferocious menace that i should have screamed had i not been as it were stunned stupefied the procession of priests swept past i averted my head from the stranger lady in a few moments i again glanced hurriedly at the place which she had occupied but she was gone then i felt relieved 
and quitting the church i frankly narrated to old margaretha these particulars as i have now unfolded them to you i methought that she was for a moment troubled as i spoke but if she were she speedily recovered her composure endeavoured to soothe me by attributing it all to my imagination and earnestly advised me not to cause any uneasiness to the count by mentioning the subject to him i readily promised compliance with this injunction and in the course of a few days ceased to think upon the incident which has made so strange but effervescent an impression on my mind doubtless dame margaretha was right in her conjecture said wagner and your imagination oh no no it was not fancy interrupted agnes hastily but listen and then judge for yourself i inform you ere now that it was about six months ago when the event which i have just related took place at that period also my noble lover the ever to be lamented andrea first experienced the symptoms of that internal disease which has alas carried him to the tomb agnes paused wiped away her tears and continued thus his visits to me consequently became less frequent i was more alone for margarita was not always a companion who could solace me for the absence of one so dearly loved as my andrea and repeated fits of deep despondency seized upon my soul at those times i felt as if some evil vague and undefinable but still terrible were impending over me was it my lord's approaching death of which i had a presentiment i know not weeks passed away the count's visits occurred at intervals growing longer and longer but his affection toward me had not abated no a malady that preyed upon his vitals retained him much at home and at last about two months ago i received through antonio the afflicting intelligence that he was confined to his bed my anguish now knew no bounds i would fly to him oh i would fly to him who was more worthy to watch by his couch than i who so dearly loved him dame margaretha represented to me how painful it would be to his lordship for um, a more to transpire through any rash proceeding on my part the more so as i knew that he had a daughter and a son i accordingly restrained my impetuous longing to hasten to his bedside i could not so easily subdue my grief one night i sat up late in my lonely chamber pondering on the melancholy position in which i was placed loving so tenderly yet not daring to fly to him whom i loved and giving way to all the mournful ideas which presented themselves to my imagination at length my mind grew bewildered by these sad reflections vague terrors gathered around me multiplying in number and augmenting in intensity until at length the very figures on the tapestry with which the room was hung appeared animated with power to scare and affright me the wind moaned ominously without and raised strange echoes within oppressive feelings crowded on my soul at length the gale swelled to a hurricane a whirlwind seldom experienced in this delicious clime howlings in a thousand tones appear to flit through the air and piercing lamentation seemed to sound down the black clouds that rolled in their mighty volumes together veiling the moon and stars in thickest gloom overcome with terror i retired to rest and i slept but troubled dreams haunted me throughout the night and i awoke at an early hour in the morning but holy angels protect me what did i behold bending over me as i lay was that same countenance which i had seen four months before in the church and now as it was then darting upon me lightnings from large black eyes that seemed to send shafts of flame and fire to the innermost recesses of my soul yet distorted as it was with demonic rage that face was still endowed with a queen-like beauty the majestic loveliness which had before struck me and which even lent force to those looks of dreadful menace that were fixed upon me there were the high forehead the proud lip curled in scorn the brilliant teeth glistening between the quivering vermilion and the swan-like arching of the dazzling neck there was also the dark glory of the luxuriant hair for a few moments i was spellbound motionless speechless clothed with terror and sublimity yet in all the flush of the most perfect beauty a strange mysterious being stood over me and i knew not whether she were a denizen of this world or a spirit from another 
perhaps the transcendent loveliness of that countenance was but a mask and the wondrous symmetry of that form but a disguise beneath which all the passions of hell were raging in the brain and in the heart of a fiend such were the ideas that flashed through my imagination and i involuntarily closed my eyes as if this action could avert the malignity that appeared to menace me but dreadful thoughts still pursued me enveloping me as it were in an oppressive mist wherein appalling though dimly seen images and forms were agitating and i again opened my eyes the lady if an earthly being she really were was gone i rose from my couch and glanced nervously around expecting almost to behold an apparition come forth from behind the tapestry or the folds of the curtains but my attention was suddenly arrested by a fact more germane to worldly occurrences the casket wherein i kept the rich presents made to me at different times by my andrea had been forced open and the most valuable portion of its contents were gone on a closer investigation i observed that the articles which were left were those that were virtuous new whereas the jewels that had been abstracted were old ones which as the count had informed me had belonged to a deceased wife on discovering this robbery i began to suspect that my mysterious visitress who caused me so much alarm was a thief of my property and i immediately summoned old margaretha she was of course astonished at the occurrence which i related and after some reflection she suddenly remembered that she had forgotten to fasten the house door ere she retired to rest on the preceding evening i chided her for a neglect which had enabled some evil-disposed woman to penetrate into my chamber and not only terrify but also plunder me she implored my forgiveness and besought me not to mention the incident to the count when next we met alas my noble andrea and i never met again i was sorely perplexed by the event which i had just related if the mysterious visitress were a common thief why did she leave any of the jewels in the casket and wherefore had she on two occasions contemplated me with looks of such dark rage and infernal menace a thought struck me could the count's daughter have discovered our amour and was it she who had come to gain possession of jewels belonging to the family i hinted my suspicions to margaretha but she speedily convinced me that they were unfounded the lady nisida is deaf and dumb she said and cannot possibly exercise such faculties of observation nor adopt such means of obtaining information as would make her acquainted with all that has occurred between her father and yourself besides she is constantly in attendance on her sire who is very very ill and now i perceive the improbability of a deaf and dumb female discovering an amour so carefully concealed but to assure myself more fully on that head i desired margaretha to describe the lady nisida this she readily did and i learnt from her that the count's daughter was of a beauty quite different from the lady whom i had seen in the church and in my own chamber in a word it appears that nisida has light hair blue eyes and a delicate form whereas the object of my interest curiosity and fear is a woman of dark italian loveliness i have little more now to say the loss of the jewels and the recollection of the mysterious lady were soon absorbed in the distressing thoughts which the serious illness of the count forced upon my mind weeks passed away and he came not but he sent repeated messages by antonio imploring me to console myself as she should soon recover and urging me not to take any step that might betray the existence of our more need i say how religiously i obeyed him in the latter respect day after day did i hope to see him again for i knew not that he was dying and i used to dress myself in my gayest attire even as i am now apparelled to welcome his expected visit alas he never came and his death was concealed from me doubtless that the sad event might not be communicated until after the funeral lest in the first frenzy of anguish i should rush to the river roller palace to imprint a last kiss upon the cheek of the corpse but a few hours ago i learned the whole truth from two female friends of dame margaretha who called to visit her and whom i had hastened to inform that she was temporarily absent my noble andrea was dead and at that very moment his funeral obsequies were being celebrated in the neighbouring church 
the very church in which i had first beheld the mysterious lady frantic with grief unmindful of the exposure that would ensue reckless of the consequences i left the house i hastened to the church i intruded my presence amid the mourners you know the rest fernand it only remains for me to say that the countenance which i beheld ere now at the window strongly delineated and darkly conspicuous amidst the blaze of light outside the casement was that of the lady whom i have thus seen for the third time but tell me fernand how could a stranger thus obtain admission to the gardens of your mansion you see yon lights agnes said wagner pointing toward the mansion which as we stated at the commencement of that chapter was situated at a distance of about two hundred yards from fernand's dwelling the backs of the two houses thus looking toward each other those lights he continued are shining in a mansion the gardens of which are separated from mine own by a simple hedge of evergreens that would not buy even the passage of a child should any inmate of that mansion possess curiosity sufficient to induce him or her to cross the boundary traverse my gardens and approach the casements of my residence that curiosity may be easily gratified and to whom does your mansion belong asked agnes to dr juras an eminent physician was the reply dr juras the physician who attended my noble andrea in his illness exclaimed agnes then the mysterious lady of whom i spoke so much and whose countenance ere now appeared at the casement must be an inmate of the house of dr duras or at all events a visitor there ah surely there is some connection between that lady and the family at riverola time will solve the mystery dearest sister for i am henceforth to call you said fernand but beneath this roof no harm can menace you and now let me summon good dame paula my housekeeper to conduct you to the apartments which have been prepared for your reception the morning is far advanced and we both stand in need of rest dame paula an elderly good-tempered kind-hearted matron shortly made her appearance and to her charge did wagner consign his newly found relative whom he now represented to be his sister but as agnes accompanied the worthy woman from the apartment she shuddered involuntarily as she passed the frame which was covered with the black cloth and which seemed ominous amidst the blaze of light that filled the room End of section ten. section eleven of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten francisco wagner and nisida on the ensuing evening francisco count of riverola was seated in one of the splendid saloons of his palace pondering upon the strange injunction which he had received from his deceased father relative to the mysterious closet when wagner was announced francisco rose to receive him saying in a cordial though melancholy tone signor i expected you and let me hasten to express the regret which i experienced at having addressed your lordship coldly and haughtily last night exclaimed wagner but at the moment i only beheld you in the son of him who had dishonoured a being very dear to my heart i can well understand your feelings on that occasion signor replied francisco alas the sins of the fathers are too often visited upon the children in this world but in in whatever direction our present conversation may turn i implore you to spare as much as possible the memory of my sire think not my lord said wagner that i should be so ungenerous as to reproach you for a deed in which you had no concern and over which you exercised no control nor should i inflict so deep an injury upon you as to speak in disrespectful terms of him who was the author of your being but who is now no more your kind language has already made me your friend exclaimed francisco and now point out to me in what manner i can in any way repair or mitigate the wrong done to that fair creature in whom you expressed yourself interested that young lady is my sister 
said wagner emphatically your sister signor and yet meseems she recognized you not long years have passed since we saw each other interrupted ferdinand for we were separated in our childhood and did you not both speak of some relative an old man who once dwelt on the confines of the black forest of germany but who is now in florence asked francisco alas that old man is no more returned wagner i did but use his name to induce agnes to place confidence in me and allow me to withdraw her from a scene which her vile grief so unpleasantly interrupted for i thought that were i then and there to announce myself as her brother she might not believe me she might suspect some treachery or snare in a city so notoriously profligate as florence but the subsequent explanations which took place between us cleared up all doubts on that subject i am well pleased to hear that the poor girl has found so near a relative and so dear a friend signor said francisco and now acquaint me i pray thee with the means whereby i may to some extent repair the injury your sister has sustained at the hands of him whose memory i implore you to spare wealth i possess in abundance oh far greater abundance than is necessary to satisfy all my wants exclaimed wagner with something of bitterness and regret in his tone but even were i poor gold would not restore my sister's honour no let that subject however pass i would only ask you count whether there be any scion of your family any lady connected with you who answers this description and wagner proceeded to delineate in minute terms the portraiture of the mysterious lady who had inspired agnes on three occasions with so much terror and whom agnes herself had depicted in such glowing language signor you are describing the lady nisida my sister exclaimed francisco struck with astonishment at the fidelity of the portrait thus verbally drawn your sister my lord cried wagner then has dame margaretha deceived agnes in representing the lady nisida to be rather a beauty of the cold north than of the sunny south dame margaretha said francisco do you allude signor to the mother of my late father's confidential dependent antonio the same was the answer it was at dame margaretha's house that your father placed my sister agnes who has resided there nearly four years but wherefore have you made those inquiries relative to the lady nisida inquired francisco i will explain the motive with frankness responded wagner he then related to the young count all those particulars relative to the mysterious lady and agnes with which the reader is already acquainted there must be some extraordinary mistake some strange error signor in all this observed francisco my poor sister is as you seem to be aware so deeply afflicted that she possesses not the faculties calculated to make her aware of the amour which even i who possess those faculties in which she is deficient never suspected and concerning which no hint ever reached me until the whole truth burst suddenly upon me last night at the funeral of my sire moreover had accident revealed to nisida the existence of the connection between my father and your sister signor she would have imparted the discovery to me such is the confidence and so great is the love that exists between us for habit has rendered us so skilful and quick in conversing with the language of the deaf and dumb that no impediment ever exists to the free interchange of our thoughts and yet if the lady nisida had made such a discovery her hatred of agnes may be well understood said wagner for her ladyship must naturally look upon my sister as the partner of her father's weakness the dishonoured slave of his passions nisida has no secret from me observed the young count firmly but wherefore did dame margaretha deceive my sister in respect to the personal appearance of the lady nisida inquired wagner i know not at the same time the door opened and nisida entered the apartment she was attired in deep black her luxuriant raven hair no longer depending in shining curls was gathered up in massy bands at the sides 
and a knot behind whence hung a rich veil that meandered over her body's splendid symmetrical length of limb in such a manner as to aid her attire in shaping rather than hiding the contours of that matchless form the voluptuous development of her bust was shrouded not concealed by the stomacher of black velvet which she wore and which set off in strong relief the dazzling whiteness of her neck the moment her lustrous dark eyes fell upon ferdinand wagner she started slightly but this movement was imperceptible alike to him whose presence caused it and to her brother francisco conveyed to her by the rapid language of the fingers the name of their visitor and at the same time intimated to her that he was the brother of agnes the young and lovely female whose strange appearance at the funeral and avowed connection with the late noble had not been concealed from the haughty lady nisida's eyes seemed to gleam with pleasure when she understood in what degree of relationship wagner stood toward agnes and she bowed to him with a degree of curtsey seldom displayed by her to strangers francisco then conveyed to her in the language of the dumb all those details already related in respect to the mysterious lady who had so haunted the unfortunate agnes a glow of indignation mounted to the cheeks of nisida and more than usually rapid was the reply she made through the medium of the alphabet of the fingers my sister desires me to express to you signor said francisco turning toward wagner that she is not the person whom the lady agnes has to complain against my sister he continued has never to her knowledge seen the lady agnes much less has she ever penetrated into her chamber and indignantly does she repel the accusation relative to the abstraction of the jewels she also desires me to inform you that last night after reading of our father's last testament she retired to her chamber which she did not quit until this morning at the usual hour and that therefore it was not her countenance which the lady agnes beheld at the casement of your saloon i pray you my lord to let the subject drop now and for ever said wagner who was struck with profound admiration almost amounting to love for the lady nisida there is some strange mystery in all this which time alone can clear up though your lordship expressed to your sister how grieved i am that any suspicion should have originated against her in respect to agnes francisco signalled these remarks to nisida and the latter rising from her seat advanced towards wagner and presented him her hand in token of her readiness to forget the injurious imputations thrown out against her ferdinand raised that fair hand to his lips and respectfully kissed it but the hand seemed to burn as he held it and when he raised his eyes toward the lady's countenance she darted on him a look so ardent and impassioned that it penetrated into his very soul that rapid interchange of glances seemed immediately to establish a kind of understanding a species of intimacy between those extraordinary beings for on the one side nisida read in the fine eyes of the handsome ferdinand all the admiration expressed there and he on his part instinctively understood that he was far from disagreeable to the proud sister of the young count of riverola while he was ready to fall at her feet and do homage to her beauty she experienced the kindling of all the fierce fires of sensuality in her breast but the unsophisticated and innocent-minded francisco observed not the expression of these emotions on either side for the manifestation occupied not a moment the interchange of such feelings is ever too vivid and electric to attract the notice of the unsuspecting observer when wagner was about to retire nisida made the following signal to her brother express to the signor that he will ever be a welcome guest at the palace of riverola for we owe kindness and friendship to the brother of her whom our father dishonoured but to the astonishment of both the count and the lady nisida wagner raised his hands and displayed as perfect a knowledge of the language of the dumb as they themselves possessed i thank you, your ladyship for this unexpected condensation he signalled by the rapid play of his fingers and i shall not forget to avail myself of this most courteous invitation it were impossible to describe the sudden glow of pleasure and delight which animated nisida's splendid countenance when she thus discovered that wagner was able to hold converse with her and she hastened to reply thus we shall expect you to revisit us soon wagner bowed low and took his departure his mind full of the beautiful nisida end of section eleven
Section twelve of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven Nisida and Wagner, Francisco and Flora, The Approach of Sunset. Upward of two months had passed away since the occurrences related in the preceding chapter, and it was now the thirty first of January, fifteen twenty one. The sun was verging towards the western hemisphere but the rapid flight of the hours was unnoticed by nisida and ferdinand wagner as they were seated together in one of the splendid saloons of the riverola mansion their looks were fixed on each other's countenance the eyes of ferdinand expressing tenderness and admiration those of nisida beaming with all the passions of her ardent and sensual soul suddenly the lady raised her hands and by the rapid play of the fingers asked ferdinand do you indeed love me as much as you would have me believe i am beloved never in this world was woman so loved as you he replied by the aid of the same language and yet i am an unfortunate being deprived of those qualities which give the greatest charm to the companionship of those who love but you are eminently beautiful my nisida and i can fancy how sweet how richly toned would be your voice could your lips frame the words i love thee a profound sigh agitated the breast of the lady and at the same time her lips quivered strangely as if she were essaying to speak wagner caught her to his breast and she wept long and plenteously those tears relieved her and she returned his warm impassioned kisses with an ardour that convinced him how dear he had become to that afflicted but transcendently beautiful being on her side the blood in her veins appeared to circulate like molten lead and her face her neck her bosom were suffused with burning blushes at length raising her head she conveyed this wish to her companion thou hast given me an idea which may render me ridiculous in your estimation but it is a whim a fancy a caprice engendered only by the profound affection i entertain for thee i would that thou should say in thy softest tenderest tones the words i love thee and by the wreathing of thy lips i shall see enough to enable my imagination to persuade itself that those words have really fallen upon my ears ferdinand smiled assent and while nisida's eyes were fixed upon him with the most enthusiastic interest he said i love thee the sovereign beauty of her countenance was suddenly lighted up with an expression of ineffable joy of indescribable delight and signalling the assurance i love thee dearest dearest ferdinand she threw herself into his arms but almost at the same moment voices were heard in the adjacent room and wagner gently disengaging himself from nisa's embrace hastily conveyed to her an intimation of the vicinity of others the lady gave him to understand by a glance that she comprehended him and they remained motionless fondly gazing upon each other i know not how it has occurred flora said the voice of francisco speaking in a tender tone in the adjoining room i know not how it has occurred that i should have addressed you in this manner so soon too after the death of my lamented father and while these mourning garments yet denote the loss which myself and sister has sustained oh my lord suffer me to retire exclaimed flora francatelli in a tone of beseeching earnestness i should not have listened to your lordship so long in the gallery of pictures much less have accompanied your lordship hither i requested thee to come with me to this apartment flora that i might declare without fear of our interview being interrupted how dear how very dear thou art to me and how honourable is the passion with which thou hast inspired me o oh, flora exclaimed the young count i could no longer conceal my love for thee my heart was bursting to reveal its secret and when i discovered thee alone ere now in the gallery of pictures i could not resist the favourable opportunity accident seemed to have afforded for this avowal alas my lord murmured flora i know not whether to rejoice or be sorrowful at the revelation which has this day met my ears and yet you said ere now that you could love me that you did love me in return ejaculated francisco i spoke truly my lord answered the bashful maiden but alas 
how can the humble obscure portionless flora become the wife of the rich powerful and honoured count of riverola there is an inseparable gulf fixed between us my lord am i not my own master can i not consult my own happiness in that most solemn and serious of the world's duties marriage cried francisco with all the generous ardour of love and his own noble disposition your lordship is free and independent in point of fact said flora in a low tender and yet impressive tone but your lordship has relations friends my relations will not thwart the wishes of him whom they love answered francisco and those who place obstacles in the way of my felicity cannot be denominated my friends oh my lord could i yield myself up to the hopes which your language inspires cried flora you can you may dearest girl exclaimed the young count and now i know that you love me but many months must elapse ere i can call thee mine and indeed a remorse smites my heart that i have dared to think my own happiness so soon after a mournful ceremony has consigned a parent to the tomb heaven knows that i do not the less deplore his loss but wherefore art thou so pale so trembling flora meseems that a superstitious awe of evil omens has seized upon my soul returned the maiden in a tremulous tone let us retire my lord the lady nisida may require my services elsewhere nisida repeated francisco as if the mention of his sister's name had suddenly awakened new ideas in his mind ah my lord said flora sorrowfully you now perceive that there is at least one who may not learn with satisfaction the alliance which your lordship would form with the poor and humble dependent nay by my patron saint thou hast misunderstood me exclaimed the young count warmly nisida will not oppose her brother's happiness and her strong mind will know how to despise those conventional usages which require that high birth should mate with high birth and wealth ally itself to wealth yes nisida will consult my felicity alone and when i ere now repeated her name as it fell from your lips it was in a manner reproachful to myself because i have retained my love for thee a secret from her a secret from nisida oh i have been cruel unjust not to have confided in my sister long ago and yet he added more slowly she might reproach me for my selfishness in bestowing a thought on marriage soon so very soon after a funeral flora dearest maiden circumstances demand that the avowal which accident and opportunity have led me this day to make should exist as a secret known only unto yourself and me but in a few months i will explain all to my sister that she will greet thee as her brother's chosen wife art thou content flora that our mutual love should remain thus concealed until the proper time shall come for its revelation yes my lord and for many reasons was the answer for many reasons flora exclaimed the young count at least for more than one rejoined the maiden in the first instance it is expedient your lordship should have due leisure to reflect upon the important step which you propose to take a step conferring so much honour on myself but which may not ensure your happiness if this be a specimen of thy reasons dear maiden exclaimed francisco laughing i need hear no more be well assured he added seriously that time will not impair the love i experience for you flora murmured a reply which did not reach wagner and immediately afterward the sound of her light steps was heard retreating from the adjacent room a profound silence of a few minutes occurred and then francisco also withdrew wagner had been an unwilling listener to the preceding conversation but while it was in progress he from time to time threw looks of love and tenderness on his beautiful companion who returned them with impassioned ardour whether it was that her irritable temper was impatient of the restraint imposed upon herself and her lover by the vicinity of others or whether she was annoyed at the fact of her brother and flora being so long together for wagner had intimated to her who their neighbours were the moment he had recognised their voices we cannot say but nisida showed an occasional uneasiness of manner which she however studied to subdue as much as possible during the scene that took place in the adjoining apartment 
Ferdinand did not offer to convey to her any idea of the nature of the conversation which occupied her brother and Flora Francatelli, neither did she manifest the least curiosity to be enlightened on that head. The moment the young lovers had quitted the next room, Wagner intimated the fact to Nisida, but at the same instant, just as he was about to bestow upon her a tender caress, a dreadful and appalling reminiscence burst upon him with such overwhelming force that he fell back stupefied on the sofa. Nisida's countenance assumed an expression of the deepest solicitude, and her eloquent, sparkling eyes implored him to intimate to her what ailed him. But, starting wildly from his seat, and casting on her a look of such bitter, bitter anguish, that the appalling emotions thus expressed struck terror to her soul, Ferdinand rushed from the room. Nisida sprung to the window, and, though the obscurity of the evening now announced the last flickerings of the setting sunbeams in the west, she could perceive her lover dashing furiously on through the spacious gardens that surrounded the Riverola Palace. On, on he went toward the River Arno, and in a few minutes was out of sight. Alas! Intoxicated with love, and thus giving himself up to the one delightful idea that he was with the beauteous Nisida, then absorbed in the interest of the conversation which he had overheard between francisco and flora wagner had forgotten until it was nearly too late that the sun was about to set on the last day of the month end of section twelve section thirteen of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Werewolf. Twas the hour of sunset. The eastern horizon, with its gloomy and sombre twilight, offered a strange contrast to the glorious glowing hues of vermilion and purple and gold that blended in long streaks athwart the western sky. For even the winter sunset of Italy is accompanied with resplendent tints, as if an emperor decked with a refulgent diadem, were repairing to his imperial couch. The declining rays of the orb of light bathed in molten gold the pinnacles, steeples, and lofty palaces of proud Florence, and toyed with the limpid waves of the Arno, on whose banks innumerable villas and casinos already sent forth delicious strains of music, broken only by the mirth of joyous revellers. And by degrees, as the sun went down, the palaces of the superb city began to shed light from their lattices, set in rich sculptured masonry, and here and there, where festivity prevailed, grand illuminations sprung up with magical quickness, the reflection from each separate galaxy rendering it bright as day far, far around. Vocal and instrumental melody floated through the still air, and the perfume of exotics, decorating the hall of the Florentine nobles, poured from the widely opened portals and rendered the air delicious for florence was gay that evening the last day of each month being the one which the wealthy lords and high-born ladies set apart for the reception of their friends the sun sank behind the western hills and even the hot-house flowers closed up their buds as if they were eyelids weighed down by slumber and not to wake until the morning should arouse them again to welcome the return of their lover that glorious sun darkness seemed to dilate upon the sky like an image in the midst of a mirage expanding into superhuman dimensions and then rapidly losing its shapeliness and covering the vault above densely and confusedly but by degrees countless stars began to stud the colourless canopy of heaven like gems of orient splendour for the last last flickering ray of the twilight in the west had expired in the increasing obscurity but hark what is that wild and fearful cry in the midst of a wood of evergreens on the bank of the arno a man young handsome and splendidly attired has thrown himself upon the ground where he writhes like a stricken serpent in horrible convulsions he is the prey of a demonic excitement an appalling consternation is on him madness is in his brain his mind is on fire lightnings appear to gleam from his eyes as if his soul were dismayed and withering within his breast oh no no he cries with a piercing shriek as if wrestling madly furiously but vainly against some unseen fiend that holds him in his grasp and the wood echoes to that terrible wail 
and the startled bird flies fluttering from its bough but lo what awful change is taking place in the form of that doomed being his handsome countenance elongates into one of savage and brute-like shape the rich garments which he wears become a rough shaggy and wiry skin his body loses its human contours his arms and limbs take another form and with a frantic howl of misery to which the woods give horribly faithful reverberations and with a rush like a hurling wind the wretch starts wildly away no longer a man but a monstrous wolf on on he goes the wood is cleared the open country is gained tree hedge and isolated cottage appear but dim points in the landscape a moment seen the next left behind the very hills appear to leap after each other a cemetery stands in the monster's way but he turns not aside through the sacred enclosure on on he goes there are situated many tombs stretching up the slope of a gentle acclivity from the dark soil of which the white monuments stand forth with white and ghastly gleaming and on the summit of the hill is the church of saint benedict the blessed from the summit of the ivy-grown tower the very rooks in the midst of their cawing are scared away by the furious rush and the wild howl of which the werewolf thunders over the hallowed ground at the same instant a train of monks appear round the angle of the church for there is a funeral at that hour and their torches flaring with the breeze that is now springing up cast an awful and almost magical light on the dark grey walls of the edifice the strange effect being enhanced by the prismatic reflection of the lurid blaze from the stained glass of the oriel window the solemn spectacle seemed to madden the werewolf his speed increased he dashed through the funeral train appalling cries of terror and alarm burst from the lips of the holy fathers and the solemn procession was thrown into confusion the coffin bearers dropped their burden and the corpse rolled out upon the ground its decomposing countenance seeming horrible by the glare of the torchlight the monk who walked nearest to the head of the coffin was thrown down by the violence with which the ferocious monster cleared its passage and the venerable father on whose brow sat the snow of eighty winters fell with his head against a monument and his brains were dashed out on on fled the werewolf over mead and hill through valley and dale the very wind seemed to make way he clove the air he appeared to skim the ground to fly through the romantic glades and rural scenes of etruria the monster sped sounds resembling shrieking howls burst ever and anon from his foaming mouth his red eyes glaring in the dusk of the evening like ominous meteors and his whole aspect so full of appalling ferocity that never was seen so monstrous so terrific a spectacle a village is gained he turns not aside but dashes madly through the little street formed by the huts and cottages of the tuscan vine dressers a little child is in his path a sweet blooming ruddy noble boy with violet coloured eyes and flaxen hair disporting merrily at a short distance from his parents who are seated at the threshold of their dwelling suddenly a strange and ominous rush an unknown trampling of rapid feet falls upon their ears then with a savage cry a monster sweeps past my child my child screams the affrighted mother and simultaneously the shrill cry of an infant in the sudden agony of death carries desolation to the ear tis done twas but the work of a moment the wolf has swept by the quick rustling of his feet is no longer heard in the village but those sounds are succeeded by awful wails and heart-rending lamentations for the child the blooming violet-eyed flaxen-haired boy the darling of his poor but tender parents is weltering in his blood on on speeds the destroyer urged by an infernal influence which maddens the more intensely because its victim strives vainly to struggle against it on on over the beaten road over the fallow field over the cottages of garden over the grounds of the rich one's rural villa and now to add to the horrors of the scene a pack of dogs have started in pursuit of the wolf dashing hurrying pushing pressing upon one another in all the anxious ardour of the chase the silence and shade of the open country in the mild starlight seem eloquently to proclaim the peace and happiness of a rural life 
but now that silence is broken by the mingled howling of the wolf and the deep baying of the hounds and this shade is crossed and darkened by the forms of the animals as they scour so fleetly oh with such whirlwind speed along but that werewolf bears a charmed life for though the hounds overtake him fall upon him and attack him with all the courage of their nature yet does he hurl them from him toss them aside spurn them away and at length free himself from their pursuit altogether and now the moon rises with unclouded splendour like a maiden looking from her lattice screened with purple curtains and still the monster hurries madly on with unrelaxing speed for hours had he pursued his way thus madly and on a sudden as he passes the outskirts of a sleeping town the church bell is struck by the watcher's hand to proclaim midnight over the town over the neighbouring fields through the far-off forest clanged that iron tongue and the werewolf sped all the faster as if he were running a race with that time whose voice had just spoken on on went the werewolf but now his course began to deviate from the right line which he had hitherto pursued and to assume a curved direction from a field a poor man was turning an ox into the main road that he might drive the animal to his master's residence by daylight the wolf swept by and snapped furiously at the ox as he passed and the beast affrighted by the sudden appearance gushing sound and abrupt though effervescent attack of the infuriate monster turned on the herdsman and gored him to death on went the terrific wolf with wilder and more frequent howlings which were answered in a thousand tones from the rocks and caverns overlooking the valley through whose bosom he was now careening with whirlwind speed along it was now two o'clock in the morning and he had already described an immense circuit from the point where he had begun to deviate from a direct course at a turning of the road as he emerged from the valley the monster encountered a party of village girls repairing with the produce of their dairies and of their poultry yards to some still far distant town which they had hoped to reach shortly after daybreak fair gay and smiling was the foremost maiden as the bright moon and the silver starlight shone upon her countenance but that sweet face clad in the richest hues of health was suddenly convulsed with horror as the terrible werewolf thundered by with appalling howls for a few moments the foremost village maiden stood rooted to the spot in speechless horror then uttering a wild cry she fell backward rolled down a steep bank and was engulfed in the rapid stream that chafed and fretted along the side of the path her companion shrieked in agony of mind the wail was echoed by a despairing cry from the drowning girl a cry that swept frantically over the rippling waters and in another moment she sank to rise no more the breeze had by this time increased to a sharp wind icy and cold as it usually is even in southern climes when the dawn is approaching and the gale now whistled through the branches of the evergreen wood in the neighbourhood of florence that vicinity to which the werewolf was at length returning still was his pace of arrow-like velocity for some terrible power appeared to urge him on and though his limbs failed not though he staggered not in his lightning speed yet did the foam at his mouth the thick flakes of perspiration on his body and the stream that enveloped him as in a dense vapour denote how distressed the unhappy being in reality was at last at last a faint tinge was visible above the eastern horizon gradually the light increased and put flight to the stars but now the oriental sky was to some extent obscured with clouds and the werewolf gnashed his teeth with rage and uttered a savage howl as if impatient of the delay of dawn his speed began to relax the infernal influence which had governed him for so many hours already grew less stern less powerful and as the twilight shone forth more plainly in proportion did the werewolf's velocity diminish suddenly a piercing chill darted through his frame and he fell in strong convulsions upon the ground in the midst of the same wood where his transformation had taken place on the preceding evening the sun rose angrily imparting a lurid reddened hue to the dark clouds that hung upon the oriental heaven as if the mantling curtains of the night's pavilion strove to repel the wooing kisses of the morn and the cold chill breeze made the branches swing to and fro with ominous flapping like the wings of a fabulous simurgh 
but in the midst of the appalling spasmodic convulsions with direful writhings on the soil and with cries of bitter anguish the werewolf gradually threw off his monster shape and at the very moment when the first sunbeam penetrated the wood and glinted on his face he rose a handsome young and perfect man once more end of section thirteen section fourteen of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen nisida's emotions the disguise the plot we must now return to nisida whom we left gazing from the window of the riverola mansion at the moment when wagner rushed away from the vicinity of his lady love on the approach of sunset the singularity of his conduct the look of ineffable horror and anguish which he cast upon her ere he parted from her presence and the abruptness of his departure filled her mind with the most torturing misgivings and with a thousand wild fears had his senses suddenly left him was he the prey to fits of mental aberration which would produce so extraordinary an effect upon him had he taken a sudden loathing and disgust to herself or had he discovered anything in respect to her which had converted his love into hatred she knew not and conjecture was vain to a woman of her excitable temperament the occurrence was particularly painful she had never known the passion of love until she had seen wagner and the moment she did see him she loved him the sentiment on her part originated altogether in the natural sensuality of her disposition there was nothing pure nothing holy nothing refined in her affection for him it was his wonderful personal beauty that had made so immediate and profound an impression upon her heart there was consequently something furious and raging in that passion which she experienced for ferdinand wagner a passion capable of every extreme the largest sacrifices or infuriate jealousies the most implicit confidence or the maddest suspicion it was a passion which would induce her to ascend the scaffold to save him or to plunge the vengeful dagger into his heart did she fancy that he deceived her to one then whose soul was animated by such a love the conduct of ferdinand was well adapted to wear even an exaggerated appearance of singularity and as each different conjecture swept through her imagination her emotions were excited to an extent which caused her countenance to vary its expressions a hundred times in a minute the fury of the desolating torrent the rage of the terrific volcano the sky cradled in the blackest clouds the ocean heaving tempestuously in its mighty bed the chafing of a tremendous flood against an embankment which seems ready every moment to give way and allow the collected waters to burst forth upon the broad plains and into the peaceful valleys all these occurrences in the physical world were imagined by the emotions that now agitated within the breast of the italian lady her mind was like the sea put in motion by the wind and her eyes flashed fire her lips quivered her bosom heaved continuously her neck arched proudly as if she were struggling against ideas that forced themselves upon her and painfully wounded her boundless patrician pride for the thought that rose uppermost amidst all the conjectures which rushed to her imagination was that fernand had conceived an invincible dislike towards her wherefore did he fly thus as if eager to place the greatest possible distance between herself and him then did she recall to mind every interchange of thought that had passed between them through the language of the fingers and she could fix upon nothing which emanating from herself had given him offence had he then really lost his senses madly did he seem to be rushing toward the arno on whose dark tide the departing rays of the setting sun glinted with oscillating and dying power she still continued to gaze from the window long after he had disappeared obscurity was gathering rapidly around but even had it been noonday she would have seen nothing her ideas grew bewildered mortification grief anger suspicion burning desire all mingled together and at length produced a species of stunning effect upon her so that the past appeared to be a dream and the future was wrapped in the darkest gloom and uncertainty this strange condition of her mind did not however last long the natural energy of her character speedily asserted its empire over the intellectual lethargy which had seized upon her and awakening from her stupor she resolved to waste not another instant in useless conjecture as to the cause of her lover's conduct hastening to her own apartments 
she dismissed flora francatelli whom she found there with an abruptness of gesture and a frowning expression of countenance amounting to an act of cruelty toward that resigned and charming girl so that as the latter hastened from the room tears dotted from her eyes and she murmured to herself can it be possible that donna nisida suspects the attachment her brother has formed towards me oh if she do the star of an evil destiny seems already to rule my horoscope scarcely had flora disappeared in this sorrowing manner when nisida secured the outer door of her own suite of apartments and hurried to her bedchamber there she threw aside the garb belonging to her sex and assumed that of a cavalier which she took from a press opening with a secret spring then having arranged her hair beneath a velvet torque shaded with waving black plumes in such a manner that the disguise was as complete as she could render it she girt on a long rapier of finest milan steel and throwing the short cloak edged with costly fur gracefully over her left shoulder she quitted her chamber by a private door opening behind the folds of the bed curtains a narrow and dark staircase admitted her into the gardens of the riverola mansion these she crossed with a step so light and free that had it been possible to observe her in the darkness of the evening she would have been taken for the most elegant and charming cavalier that ever honoured the florentine republic with his presence in about a quarter of an hour she reached the abode of dr duras but instead of entering it she passed round at one of its angles and opening a wicket by means of a key which she had about her gained access to the gardens in the rear of the mansion she traversed these grounds with hasty steps passing the boundary which separated them from the gardens of wagner's dwelling and then relaxing her pace advanced with more caution to the windows of this very apartment where agnes had been so alarmed two months previously by observing the countenance at the casement but all was dark now within wagner was not in his favourite room for nisida knew that this was her lover's favourite apartment perhaps he had not yet returned thus thought the lady and she walked slowly round the spacious dwelling which like the generality of the british mansions of florence in those times as indeed is now the case to a considerable extent stood in the midst of extensive gardens there were lights in the servants offices but every other room seemed dark no one window in the front and the ground floor shone with the lustre of a lamp nisida approached it and beheld agnes reclining in a pensive manner on a sofa in a small but elegantly furnished apartment her countenance was immediately overclouded and for an instant she lingered to gaze upon the sylph-like form that was stretched upon that ottoman then she hastily pursued her way and having perfected the round of the building once more reached the windows of her lover's favourite room convinced that he had not returned and fearful of being observed by any of the domestics who might happen to pass through the gardens nisida retraced her way toward the dwelling of dr duras but her heart was now heavy for she knew not how to act her original object was to obtain an interview with wagner that very night and learn if possible the reason of his extraordinary conduct toward her for the idea of remaining in suspense for many long long hours was painful in the extreme to a woman of her excitable nature she was however compelled to resign herself to this alternative and having let herself through the wicket belonging to the physician's gardens she directed her steps homeward on her way she passed by the gate of the convent of carmelite nuns one of the wealthiest most strictly disciplined and celebrated monastic establishments in the florentine republic it appeared that a sudden thought here struck her for ascending to the steep leading to the gate she paused beneath the lamp of the deep gothic portico took out her tablets and hastily wrote the following words donna nisida of riverola requests an interview with the lady abbess maria to-morrow at midday on a matter seriously regarding the spiritual welfare of a young female who has shown great and signal disregard for the rites and ordinances of the most holy catholic church and in respect to whom the most severe measures must be adopted donna nisida will visit the holy mother to-morrow at midday having written these words nisida tore off the leaf and thrust it through a small square grating set in the massive door of the convent then ringing the bell to call attention to the gate she hastily pursued her way homeward she had gained the gardens of the riverola mansion and was advancing towards the door of the private staircase leading to her chamber when she suddenly perceived two dark figures standing within a few yards of her fearful that they might be domestics belonging to the household 
she hastily and noiselessly retreated within the deep shade of the wall of the mansion and there she remained motionless we must now detail the conversation which passed between the two individuals whose presence in the garden had thus alarmed the lady nisida but are you sure of what you say antonio demanded one of the men by saint jacopo i cannot be mistaken was the reply the closet has been locked up for years and years and the old count always used to keep the keys in an iron chest which was also carefully locked and chained around what can the place possibly contain but a treasure after all it is only conjecture on your part and that being the case it is not worth while to risk one's life you are a coward stefano exclaimed antonio angrily the closet has got a heavy massive door and a prodigiously strong lock and if these precautions were not adopted to protect a hoard of wealth why were they taken at all let me ask you there is something in what you say replied stefano do you do wrong to call me a coward if it were not that we were cousins and linked by a bond of long maintained friendship i would send my rapier through your doublet in a twinkling nay i do not mean to anger thee stefano cried the valet but let us speak lower chafe not i pray thee well well said the other gloomily go on in the name of your patron saint only keep a guard upon your tongue for it wags somewhat too freely and remember that a man who has been for fifteen years the captain of as gallant a band as ever levied contributions on the lieges of the republic is not to have a coward thrown in his teeth let it pass good stefano urged the valet i tell thee that a closet whereof i have spoken can contain naught save a treasure perhaps in gold perhaps in massive plate we can dispose of either to our advantage observed the bandit with a coarse chuckle will you undertake the business demanded antonio i will was the resolute answer and as much to convince you that stefano is not a coward as for any other reason but when is it to be done and why did you make an appointment to meet me here of all places in florence it can be done when you choose replied antonio and as for the other questions i desired you to meet me here because i knew that you would not refuse a fine chance and suspecting this much it was necessary to show you the geography of the place good observed the robber chief to-morrow night i have a little affair in hand for a reverend and holy father who is sure to be chosen superior of his order if his rival in the candidature be removed and in four-and-twenty hours the said rival must be food for the fishes of the arno then the night after that suggested antonio pre-engaged again returned the bandit captain coolly a wealthy countess has been compelled to pledge her diamonds to a jew on sunday next she must appear with her husband at the place of the medici and on saturday night therefore the diamonds must be recovered from the jew then the husband knows not that they are so pledged said antonio scarcely answered the brigand they were deposited with the jew for a loan which the countess raised to accommodate her lover now do you understand perfectly what say you to next monday night i am at your service responded stefano monday will suit me admirably and midnight shall be the hour and now instruct me in the nature of the locality come with me and i will show you by which way you and your comrades must effect an entry said antonio the valet and the robber chief now moved away from the spot where they had stood to hold the above conversation and the moment they had turned the adjacent angle of this mansion nisida hastened to regain her apartment by the private staircase resolving however to see wagner as early as possible in the morning end of section fourteen section fifteen of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the last meeting of agnes and the stranger lady while all nature was wrapped in the listening stillness of admiration at the rising sun ferdinand wagner dragged himself painfully toward his home his garments were besmeared with mud and dirt they were torn too in many places and here and there were stains of blood still wet upon them in fact had he been dragged by a wild horse through a thicket of brambles he could scarcely have appeared in a more wretched plight his countenance was ghastly pale terror still flashed from his eyes and despair sat on his lofty brow 
stealing through the most concealed part of his garden he was approaching his own mansion with the air of a man who returns home in the morning after having perpetrated some dreadful deed of turpitude under the cover of the night but the watchful eyes of Ormond had marked his coming from the lattice of her window and in a few minutes agnes light as a fawn came bounding toward him exclaiming oh what a night of uneasiness have i passed ferdinand but at length thou art restored to me thou whom i have ever loved so fondly although she added mournfully i abandon thee for so long a time and she embraced him tenderly agnes cried ferdinand repulsing her with an impatience which she had never experienced at his hands before therefore thus act the spy upon me believe me that although we pass ourselves off as brother and sister yet i do not renounce that authority which the real nature of those ties that bind us together fernan fernan this to me exclaimed agnes bursting into tears oh how have i deserved such reproaches my dearest girl pardon me forgive me cried wagner in a tone of bitter anguish my god i ought not to upbraid thee for that watchfulness during my absence and that joy at my return which prove that you love me again i say pardon me dearest agnes you need not ask me fernand was the reply only speak kindly to me i do i will agnes interrupted wagner but leave me now let me regain my own chamber alone i have reasons urgent reasons for doing so and this afternoon agnes i shall be composed collected again do you proceed by that path i will take this and hastily pressing her hand wagner broke abruptly away for a few moments agnes stood still looking after him in vacant astonishment at his extraordinary manner and also at his alarming appearance but concerning which latter she had not dared to question him when he had entered the mansion by a private door agnes turned and pursued her way along a circuitous path shaded on each side by dark evergreens and which was the one he had directed her to take so as to regain the front gate of the dwelling but scarcely had she advanced a dozen paces when a sudden rustling among the trees alarmed her and in an instant a female form tall majestic and with a dark veil thrown over her head stood before her agnes uttered a faint shriek for although the lady's countenance was concealed by the veil she had no difficulty in recognising the stranger who had already terrified her on three previous occasions and who seemed to haunt her and as if to dispel all doubt as to the identity the majestic lady suddenly tore aside her veil and disclosed to the trembling shrinking agnes features already too well known but if the lightning of those brilliant burning black eyes had seemed terrible on former occasions they were now absolutely blasting and agnes fell upon her knees exclaiming mercy mercy how have i offended you for a few moments those basilisk eyes darted forth shafts of fire and flame and the red lips quivered violently and the haughty brow contracted menacingly and agnes was stupefied stunned fascinated terribly fascinated by that tremendous rage the vengeance of which seemed ready to explode against her but only a few moments lasted that dreadful scene for the lady whose entire appearance was that of an avenging fiend in the guise of a beauteous woman suddenly drew up a sharp poniard from its sheath in her bodice and plunged it into the bosom of the hapless agnes the victim fell back but not a shriek not a sound escaped her lips the blow was well aimed the poniard was sharp and went deep and death followed instantaneously for nearly a minute did the murderess stand gazing on the corpse the corpse of one erst so beautiful and her countenance gradually relaxing from its stern implacable expression assumed an air of deep remorse of bitter bitter compunction but probably yielding to the sudden thought that she must provide for her own safety the murderess drew forth the dagger from the white bosom in which it was buried hastily wiped it upon a leaf returned it to the sheath and replacing the veil over her countenance hurried rapidly away from the scene of her fearful crime End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen. The Spirry. The Arrest. 
scarcely ten minutes had elapsed since the unfortunate agnes was thus suddenly cut off in the bloom of youth and beauty when a lieutenant of police with his guard of sibiri passed along the road skirting wagner's garden they were evidently in search of some malefactor for stopping in their course they began to deliberate on the business which they had in hand which way could he possibly have gone cried one striking the butt end of his pike heavily upon the ground how could we possibly have missed him exclaimed another stefano is not so easily caught my men observed the lieutenant he is the most astute and cunning of the band of which he is the captain and yet i wish we had pounced upon him since we were so nicely upon his track and a thousand ducats offered by the state for his capture suggested one of the sbirri yes tis annoying ejaculated the lieutenant but i could have sworn he passed this way and i could bear the same evidence signor observed the first speaker maybe he has taken refuge in those bushes not unlikely we are fools to grant him a moment's vantage ground over the fence my men and beat amongst these gardens thus speaking the lieutenant set the example by leaping the railing and entering the grounds belonging to wagner's abode the sbirri who were six in number including their officer divided themselves into two parties and proceeded to search the garden suddenly a loud cry of horror burst from one of the sections and when the other hastened to the spot the sbirri composing it found their comrades in the act of raising the corpse of agnes she is quite dead said the lieutenant placing his hand upon her heart and yet the crime cannot have been committed many minutes as the corpse is scarcely cold and the blood still oozes forth what a lovely creature she must have been exclaimed one of the sbirri cease your profane remarks my man cried the lieutenant this must be examined into directly does any one know who dwells in that mansion signor wagner a wealthy german was the reply given by a spiro then come with me my man said the lieutenant and let us lose no time in searching his house one of you must remain by the corpse and the rest may continue the search after the bandit stefano having issued these orders the lieutenant followed by the spiro whom he had chosen to accompany him hastened to the mansion the gate was opened by an old porter who stared in astonishment when he beheld the functionaries of justice visiting that peaceful dwelling but the lieutenant ordered him to close and lock the gate and having secured the key the officer said we must search this house a crime has been committed close at hand a crime ejaculated the porter then the culprit is not here for there is not a soul beneath this roof who would perpetrate her misdeed cease your prating old man said the lieutenant sternly we have a duty to perform see that we be not molested in executing it but what is the crime signor of which nay that you shall know anon interrupted the lieutenant in the name of his serene highness the duke i command you in the first place to lead me and my followers to the presence of your master the old man hastened to obey this mandate and he conducted the sbirri into the chamber where wagner having thrown off his garments was partaking of that rest which he so much needed at the sound of heavy feet and the clanking of martial weapons fernand started from the slumber into which he had fallen only a few minutes previously what means this insolent intrusion he exclaimed his cheeks flushing with anger at the presence of the police pardon us signor said the lieutenant in a respectful tone but a dreadful crime has been committed close by indeed within the enclosure of your own grounds a dreadful crime ejaculated wagner yes signor a crime the officer was interrupted by an ejaculation of surprise which burst from the lips of his attendant spiro and turning hastily round he beheld his follower intently scrutinizing the attire which ferdinand had ere now thrown off ah bloodstains cried the lieutenant whose attention was directed towards those marks by the finger of his man then is the guilty one speedily discovered signor he added turning once more toward wagner are those your garments an expression of indescribable horror convulsed the countenance of ferdinand for the question of the officer naturally reminded him of his dreadful fate the fate of a werewolf although we should observe he never remembered when restored to the form of a man what he might have done during the long hours that he wore the shape of a ferocious monster still as he knew that his garments had been soiled torn and blood-stained in the course of the preceding night it was no wonder that he shuddered and became convulsed with mental agony when his terrible doom was so forcibly called to his mind 
his emotions were naturally considered to be corroborative evidence of guilt and the lieutenant laying his hand upon wagner's shoulder said in a stern solemn manner in the name of his highness our prince i arrest you for the crime of murder murder repeated wagner dashing away the officer's arm you dare not accuse me of such a deed i accuse you of murder signor exclaimed the lieutenant within a hundred paces of your dwelling a young lady a young lady cried wagner thinking of agnes whom he had left in the garden yes signor a young lady has been most barbarously murdered added the officer in an impressive tone agnes agnes almost screamed the unhappy man as this dreadful announcement fell upon his ears oh is it possible that thou art no more my poor agnes he covered his face with his hands and wept bitterly the lieutenant made a sign to his follower who instantly quitted the room there must be some mistake in this signor said the old porter approaching the lieutenant and speaking in a voice tremulous with emotion the master whom i serve and whom you accuse is incapable of the deed imputed to him yes god knows how truly you speak ejaculated wagner raising his head that girl oh sooner than have harmed one single hair of her head but how know you that it is agnes who is murdered he cried abruptly turning toward the lieutenant it was you who said it signor calmly replied the officer as he fixed his dark eyes keenly upon ferdinand oh it was a surmise a conjecture because i parted with agnes a short time ago in the garden exclaimed wagner speaking in hurried and broken sentences behold the victim said the lieutenant who had approached the window from which he was looking wagner sprung from his couch and glanced forth into the garden beneath the sbirri were advancing along the gravel pathway bearing amongst them the corpse of agnes upon whose pallid countenance the morning sunbeams were dancing as if in mockery even at death holy virgin it is indeed agnes cried wagner in a tone of the most profound heart-rending anguish and he fell back senseless in the arms of the lieutenant an hour afterward fernand wagner was the inmate of a dungeon beneath the palace inhabited by the duke of florence End of section 16. Section 17 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Nisida and the Carmelite and Abbess. Punctually at midday, the Lady Nisida of Riverola proceeded alone and unattended to the convent of carmelite nuns where she was immediately admitted into the presence of the abbess the superior of this monastic establishment was a tall thin stern-looking woman with a sallow complexion an imperious compression of the lips and small grey eyes that seemed to flicker with malignity rather than to beam with the pure light of christian love she was noted for the austerity of her manners the rigid discipline which she maintained in the convent and the inexorable disposition which she showed toward those who having committed a fault came within her jurisdiction rumour was often busy with the affairs of the carmelite convent and the grand ams and gossips of florence were huddled together around their domestic hearths on the cold winter's evenings and venture mysterious hints and whispers of strange deeds committed within the walls of that sacred institution how from time to time some young and beautiful nun had suddenly disappeared to the surprise and alarm of her companions how piercing shrieks had been heard to issue from the interior of the building by those who passed near it at night and how the inmates themselves were often aroused from their slumbers by strange noises resembling the rattling of chains the working of ponderous machinery and the revolution of huge wheels such food for scandal as those mysterious whispers supplied was not likely to pass without exaggeration and that love of the marvellous which inspired the aforesaid gossips led to the establishment of the rumours just glanced at so that one declared with a solemn shake of the head how spirits were seen to glide around the convent walls at night and another averred that a nun with whom she was acquainted had assured her that strange and unearthly forms were often encountered by those inmates of the establishment who were hardy enough to venture into the chapel or to reverse the long corridors or gloomy cloisters after dusk these vague and uncertain reports did not however prevent some of the wealthiest families in florence from placing their daughters in the carmelite convent a nobleman or opulent citizen who had several daughters 
would consider it a duty to devote one of them to the service of the church and the votive girl was most probably compelled to perform her novitiate and take the veil in this renowned establishment it was essentially the convent patronized by the aristocracy and no female would be received within its walls save on the payment of a considerable sum of money there was another circumstance which added to the celebrity and augmented the wealth of the carmelite convent did a young unmarried lady deviate from the path of virtue or did a husband detect the infidelity of his wife the culprit was forthwith consigned to the care of the abbess and forced to take up her abode in that monastic institution or again did some female openly neglect her religious duties or imprudently express an opinion antagonistic to the roman catholic church the family to which she belonged would remove her to the spiritual care of the abbess the convent was therefore considered to be an institution recognized by the state as a means of punishing immorality upholding the catholic religion persuading the sceptical confirming the wavering and exercising a salutary terror over the ladies of the upper class at that period renowned for their dissolute morals the aristocracy of florence patronized and protected the institution because its existence afforded a ready means to get rid of a dishonoured daughter or an unfaithful wife and it was even said that the abbess was invested with extraordinary powers by the rescript of the duke himself powers which warranted her interference with the liberty of young females who were denounced to her by their parents guardians or others who might have a semblance of a right to control or coerce them luther had already begun to make a noise in germany and the thunders of his eloquence had reverberated across the alps to the italian states the priesthood was alarmed and the conduct of the reformer was an excuse for rendering the discipline of the monastic institutions more rigid than ever nor was the abbess maria a woman who hesitated to avail herself of this fact as an apology for strengthening her despotism and widening the circle of her influence the reader has now heard enough to make him fully aware that the carmelite convent was an establishment enjoying influence exercising an authority and wielding a power which if these were misdirected constituted an enormous abuse in the midst of states bearing the name of a republic but the career of the medici was then hastening toward a close and in proportion as the authority of the duke became more circumscribed the encroachments of the ecclesiastical orders grew more extensive the abbess maria who was far advanced in years and was endowed with one of those vigorous intellects against which time vainly directs his influence received the lady nisida in a little parlour plainly furnished the praying desk was of the most humble description and above it rose a cross of wood so worm-eaten and decayed that it seemed as if the grasp of a strong hand would crush it into dust but this emblem of the creed had been preserved in the carmelite convent since the period of the second crusade and was reported to consist of a piece of the actual cross on which the saviour suffered in palestine against the wall hung a scourge with five knotted throngs whereon the blood stains noted the severity of that penance which the abbess frequently inflicted upon herself on a table stood a small loaf of coarse bread and a pitcher of water for although a sumptuous banquet was every day served up in the refectory the abbess was never known to partake of the delicious viands nor to place her lips in contact with wine when nisida entered the presence of the abbess she sank on her knees and folded her arms meekly across her bosom the holy mother gave her a blessing and made a motion for her to rise nisida obeyed and took a seat near the abbess at the table she then drew forth her tablets and wrote a few lines which her superior read with deep attention nisida placed a heavy purse of gold upon the table and the abbess nodded an assent to the request contained in the lines inscribed on the tablet the interview was about to terminate when the door suddenly opened and an elderly nun entered the room ursula said the lady abbess in a cold but reproachful tone didst thou not know that i was engaged what means this abrupt intrusion pardon me holy mother exclaimed the nun but the rumour of such frightful murder has just reached us a murder ejaculated the abbess oh unhappy florence when wilt thou say farewell to crimes which render thy name detestable among italian states this indeed too holy mother is one of inordinate blackness continued sister ursula a young beautiful lady we know not personal beauty within these walls daughter interrupted the abbess sternly 
true holy mother and yet i did but repeat the tale as the porteress ere now related it to me however resumed ursula it appears that a young female whom the worldly minded outside these sacred walls denominate beautiful was barbarously murdered this morning shortly after the hour of sunrise within the precincts of florence inquired the abbess within a short distance of the convent holy mother answered the nun the dreadful deed was accomplished in the garden attached to the mansion of a certain signor wagner whom the worldly-minded style a young man wondrously handsome a fair exterior often conceals a dark heart daughter said the abbess but who was the hapless victim rumour declares holy mother the nun checked herself abruptly and glanced at nisida who during the above conversation had approached the windows which commanded a view of the convent garden and whose back was therefore turned toward the abbess and ursula you may speak fearlessly daughter said the abbess that unfortunate lady hears you not for she is both deaf and dumb holy virgin succour her exclaimed ursula crossing herself i was about to inform your ladyship she continued that rumour represents the murdered woman to have been the sister of this signor wagner of whom i spoke but it is more than probable that there was no tie of relationship between them and that i understand you daughter interrupted the abbess alas how much wickedness is engendered in this world by the sensual fleshly passion which mortals denominate love but is the murderer detected the murderer was arrested immediately after the perpetration of the crime responded ursula and at this moment he is a prisoner in the dungeon of the palace who is the lost man that has perpetuated such a dreadful crime demanded the abbess again crossing herself signor wagner himself holy mother was the reply the pious duke cosmo bequeathed gold to this institution said the abbess that masses might be offered up for the souls of those who fall beneath the weapon of the assassin see that the lamented prince's instructions be not neglected in this instance ursula it was to remind your ladyship of this duty that i ventured to break upon your privacy returned the nun who then withdrew the abbess approached nisida and touched her upon the shoulder to intimate to her that they were again alone together she had drawn down her veil and was leaning her forehead against one of the iron bars which protected the window apparently in a mood for deep thought when the abbess touched her she started abruptly round then pressing the superior's hand with convulsive violence hurried from the room the old porteress presented the arms-box as she opened the gate of the convent but nisida pushed it rudely aside and hurried down the steps as if she were escaping from a lazar house rather than issuing from a monastic institution End of section 17section eighteen of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen wagner in prison a visitor it was evening and wagner paced his narrow dungeon with agitated steps far beneath the level of the ground and under the ducal palace was that gloomy prison having no window save a grating in the massive door to admit the air a lamp burning dimly upon the table whereon stood also the coarse prison fare provided for the captive but which was untouched the clanking of the weapons of the sentinels who kept guard in the passage from which the various dungeons opened fell mournfully upon ferdinand's ears and every moment reminded him of the apparent impossibility to escape even if such an idea possessed him the lamp had burned throughout the day in his dungeon for the light of heaven could not penetrate that horrible subterranean cell and it was only by the payment of gold that he had induced the jailer to permit him the indulgence of the artificial substitute for the rays of the glorious sun oh wretched being that i am he thought within himself as he paced the stone floor of his prison-house the destiny of the accursed is mine dotard that i was to exchange the honours of old age for the vicissitudes of a renewed existence had nature taken her course i should probably now be sleeping in a quiet grave and my soul might be in the regions of the blessed but the tempter came and dazzled me with prospects of endless happiness and i succumbed o oh, faust would that thou hadst never crossed the threshold of my humble cottage in the black forest how much sorrow how much misery should i have been spared better better to have remained in poverty solitude helplessness 
borne down by the weight of the years and crushed by the sense of utter loneliness oh better to have endured all this than to have taken on myself a new tenure of that existence which is so marked with misery and woe he threw himself upon a seat and endeavoured to reflect on his position with calmness but he could not starting up he again paced the dungeon in an agitated manner holy god he exclaimed aloud how much wretchedness has fallen upon me in a single day agnes murdered nisida perhaps for ever estranged from me myself accused of a dreadful crime whereof i am innocent and circumstances all combining so wonderfully against me but who could have perpetrated the appalling deed can that mysterious lady whom agnes spoke of so frequently and who by her description so closely resembles my much-loved nisida can she at that moment the bolts were suddenly drawn back from the door of the dungeon the clanking chains fell heavily on the stone pavement outside and the jailer appeared holding a lamp in his hand your brother signor is come to visit you said the turnkey but pray let the interview be a brief one for it is as much as my situation and my own liberty are worth to have admitted him without an order from the chief judge with these words the jailer made way for a cavalier to enter the dungeon and as he closed the door he said i shall return shortly till he let your brother out again surprise had hitherto placed a seal upon wagner's lips but even before the visitor had entered the cell a faint suspicion a wild hope had flashed to his mind that nisida had not forgotten him that she would not abandon him but this hope was destroyed almost as soon as formed by the sudden recollection of her affliction for how could a deaf and dumb woman succeed in bribing and deceiving one so cautious and wary as the jailer of a criminal prison nevertheless the moment the visitor had entered the cell and in spite of the deep disguise which she wore the eyes of the lover failed not to recognize the object of his adoration in that elegant cavalier who now stood before him scarcely had the jailer closed and bolted the massive door again when wagner rushed forward to clasp nisida in his arms but imperiously waving her hand she motioned him to stand back then with the language of the fingers she rapidly demanded will you swear upon the cross that the young female who has been murdered was not your mistress i swear answered ferdinand in the same symbolic manner and as the light of the lamp played on his handsome countenance his features assumed so decided an expression of truth frankness and sincerity that nisida was already more than half convinced of the injustice of her suspicions but still she was determined to be completely satisfied and drawing forth a small but exquisitely sculptured crucifix from her doublet she presented it to her lover he sank upon one knee received it respectfully and kissed it without hesitation nisida threw herself into his arms and embraced him with a fondness as warm as wild as impassioned as her suspicions had here now been vehement and fearfully resentful her presence called ferdinand to forget his sorrow to forget that he was in a dungeon to forget also the tremendous charge that hung over his head for never had his niece had appeared to him so marvellously beautiful as he now beheld her disguised in the graceful garb of a cavalier of that age though tall majestic and of rich proportions for a woman yet in the attire of the opposite sex she seemed slight short and eminently graceful the velvet cloak sat so jauntily on her sloping shoulder the doublet became her symmetry so well and the rich lace collar was so arranged as to disguise the prominence of the chest that voluptuous fullness which could not be compressed at length a sudden thought struck ferdinand and he inquired in the usual manner how nisida had gained access to him a faithful friend contrived the interview for me she replied with her wonted rapidity of play upon the fingers he led the jailer to believe that i was a german and totally unacquainted with the italian tongue thus not a word was addressed to me and gold has opened the door which separated me from you the same means shall secure your escape dearest nisida signalled wagner i would not escape were the door of my dungeon left open and the sentinels removed i am innocent and that innocence must be proved the lady exhibited extraordinary impatience at this reply you do not believe me guilty asked wagner she shook her head in a determined manner to show how profound was her conviction of his innocence then do not urge me beloved one to escape and be dishonoured for ever was the urgent prayer he conveyed to her the evidence against you will be overwhelming she gave him to understand then with an air of the most heart-appealing supplication she added 
escape dearest ferdinand for my sake that i should be compelled to fly from florence and wouldst thou accompany me she shook her head mournfully then i will remain here in this dungeon if my innocence be proved i may yet hope to call the sister of the count of riverola my wife if i be condemned he paused for he knew that even if he were sentenced to death he could not die that some power of which however he had only a vague notion would rescue him that the compact which gave him renewed youth and a long life on the fatal condition of his periodical transformation into a horrid monster must be fulfilled and though he saw not understood not how all this was to be still he knew that it would happen if he should really be condemned nisida was not aware of this motive which had checked her lover as he was conveying to her his sense of the dread alternatives before him and she hastened to intimate to him the following thought you would say that if you be condemned you will know how to meet death as becomes a brave man but think of me of nisida who loves you would you continue to love a man branded as a murderer i should only think of you as my own dear ferdinand he shook his head as much as to say it cannot be and then once more embraced her fondly for he beheld in her anxiety for his escape only a proof of her ardent affection at this moment the jailer returned and while he was unbolting the door nisida made one last imploring appeal to her lover to give his assent to escape if the arrangements were made for that purpose but he conveyed to her his resolute determination to meet the charge with the hope of proving his innocence and for a few moments nisida seemed convulsed with the most intense anguish of soul the jailer made his appearance and wagner to maintain the deceit which nisida informed him to have been practised on the man said a few words aloud in german as if he were really taking leave of a brother nisida embraced him tenderly and conveying her countenance as much as possible with her slouched hat the waving plumes of which she made to fall over her face this extraordinary being issued from the cell End of section 18。section 19 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Flora Fan Catelli, The Three Nuns, The Chair. Nisida regained her apartment by the private staircase without any molestation. Having laid aside her male attire, she assumed a loose wrapper and then throwing herself into an armchair gave way to her reflections these were apparently of no pleasurable nature for they were frequently interrupted by convulsive starts and rapid glancings around the room as if she were fearful lest some terrible spectre were present to scare her once or twice her eyes lingered on her mother's portrait and then profound sighs escaped her bosom presently the beautiful flora francatelli entered the apartment but nisida made her a sign of dismissal the maiden withdrew and we must now follow her to her own chamber on reaching her bedroom flora did not immediately retire to rest she felt that she should not sleep even were she to seek her pillow for she had much very much to ponder upon there was a marked undisguised reserve about her mistress which materially affected her although she could not control her affections yet she felt as if she were acting with duplicity toward the lady nisida in having listened to the love tale of francisco and retaining that revelation of his affection a secret in her own breast yet had he not implored had he not enjoined her to keep that avowal to herself yes and when she looked at the matter as it were face to face she could not justly reproach herself nevertheless that secret love weighed upon her conscience like a crime she could not understand wherefore nisida's manner had changed toward her francisco had assuredly made no communication to his sister and nothing had transpired to excite a suspicion of the real truth in her mind still there was a coolness on the part of that lady or might it not be that flora's imagination deceived her there was another and even a more serious cause of grief weighing upon her mind dispatches had been received from the nobleman in whose suit her brother alessandro had repaired to constantinople and the secretary of the council of florence had intimated to signora francatelli flora's aunt that alessandro had abjured the faith of his forefathers and had embraced the mussulman creed it was also stated that the young man had entered the service of the grand vizier but whether he had become a renegade through love for some turkish maiden 
or with the hope of ameliorating his condition in a worldly point of view whether indeed self-interest or a conscientious belief in the superiority of the moslem doctrines over those of christianity had swayed alessandro no one could say his aunt was almost heartbroken at the news father marco through whose influence he had obtained the post of secretary to the florentine envoy was shocked and grieved and flora was not the less afflicted at an event which as she had been taught to believe must inevitably place her much-loved brother beyond the hope of spiritual salvation amidst the gloomy reflections excited by the lady nisida's coolness and the disagreeable tidings which had been received concerning her brother there was nevertheless one gleam of consolation for flora francatelli this was the love which francisco entertained for her and which she so tenderly so sincerely reciprocated yes a maiden's first love is ever a source of solace amidst the gloom of affliction because it is so intimately intertwined with hope for the soul of the innocent artless girl who fondly loves soars aloft in a heaven of her own creation dove-like on the wings of faith it was already late when flora began to unbraid and set at liberty her dark brown tresses preparatory to retiring to rest when a low knock at the chamber door startled her in the midst of her occupation thinking it might be the lady nisida who required her attendance she hastened to open the door and immediately three women dressed in religious habits and having black veils thrown over their heads so as completely to conceal their faces entered the room flora uttered a faint scream for the sudden apparition of those spectre-like figures at such a late hour of the night was well calculated to alarm even a person of maturer age and stronger mind than signora francatelli you must come with us young lady said the foremost nun advancing toward her and beware how you create any disturbance for it will avail you nothing whither am i to be conducted asked flora trembling from head to foot that we cannot inform you was the reply neither must you know at present and therefore our first duty is to blindfold you pity me have mercy upon me exclaimed flora throwing herself on her knees before the nun who addressed her in so harsh so stern a manner i am a poor unprotected girl have mercy upon me but the three nuns seized upon her and while one held the palm of her hand forcibly over her mouth so as to check her utterance the others hastily blindfolded her flora was so overcome by this alarming proceeding that she fainted when she came to her senses she found herself lying on a hard and sorry couch in a large apartment almost entirely denuded of furniture and lighted by a feebly burning lamp suspended to a low ceiling for a moment she thought she was labouring under the influence of a hideous dream but glancing around she started with a fright and a scream burst from her lips when she beheld the three nuns standing by the bed why have you brought me hither she demanded springing from the couch and addressing the recluses with frantic wildness to benefit you in a spiritual sense replied the other who had before acted as spokeswoman to purge your mind of those mundane vanities which have seized upon it and to render you worthy of salvation pray sisters pray for this at present benighted creature then to the surprise of the young maiden the three nuns all fell upon their knees around her and began to chant a solemn hymn in the most lugubrious notes they had thrown aside their veils and the flickering light of the dim lamp gave a ghastly and unearthly appearance to their pale and severe countenances they were all elderly persons and their aspect was that of cold forbidding nature which precludes hope on the part of any one who might have to implore mercy the young maiden was astounded stupefied she knew not what to conjecture where was she who were those nuns that had treated her so harshly why was she brought to that cold cheerless apartment what meant the hymn that seemed chanted expressly on her account she could not bear up against the bewilderment and alarm produced by these questions which she asked herself and none of which she could solve an oppressive sensation came over her and she was about to sink back upon the couch from which she had risen when the hymn suddenly ceased the nuns rose from their supplicant position and the foremost addressing the poor girl in a reproachful tone exclaimed oh wicked worldly-minded creature repent 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 there was something so awful so appalling in this strange conduct on the part of the nuns that flora began to doubt whether she were not labouring under some terrible delusion she feared lest her senses were leaving her and covering her face with her hands so as to close her eyes against external objects she endeavoured to look inward as it were and scrutinise her own soul but she was not allowed time to reflect 
for the three nuns seized upon her the foremost saying you must come with us mercy mercy screamed the wretched girl vainly struggling in the powerful grasp of the recluses her long hair which she had unbraided before she was carried off from the riverola mansion floated over her shoulders and enhanced the expression of ineffable despair which her pallid countenance now wore wildly she glanced around as she was being hurried from the room and frantic screams escaped her lips but there was no one nigh to succour no one to melt at the outbursts of her anguish the three nuns dragged rather than conducted her to an adjacent apartment which was lighted by a lamp of astonishing brilliancy and hung in a skylight raised above the roof on the floor immediately beneath this lamp stood an armchair of wickerwork and from this chair two stout cords ascended to the ceiling through which they had passed by means of two holes perforated for the purpose when flora was dragged by the nuns to the immediate vicinity of the chair which her excited imagination instantly converted into an engine of torture that part of the floor on which the chair stood seemed to tremble and oscillate beneath her feet as if it were a trap-door the most dreadful sensations now came over her she felt as if her brain was reeling as if she must go mad a fearful scream burst from her lips and she struggled with the energy of desperation as the nuns endeavoured to thrust her into the chair no no she exclaimed frantically you shall not torture me you dare not murder me what have i done to merit this treatment mercy mercy but her cries and her struggles were alike useless for she was now firmly bound to the chair into which the nuns had forced her to seat herself then commenced the maddening scene which will be found in the ensuing chapter end of section nineteen